Alright, we're good. <laughs> uh, can you bring out I can't sleep? <laughs> so we were muted? Is that what the we problem were muted, yes. <laughs> okay, well that's a great lecture. So, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's like going to the cinema in the nineteen twenties. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. That's okay. We we are into the talkies now, as I said. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, Preskin had the first version of this, and Stone, with a collaborator, he was also a student. He tried to do the analog or something. So the issue I going to you was going to see what the problem is. So this is in 1978, I think, and this problem was revisited by Dasgupta and by his, his brother Bert Halperin in 1981 uh, for reasons that you will understand why because it was part of an obsession that Bert had and probably still has. Yes? Yeah, in 3D dimension and vortex, maybe a line or maybe point is normal. I don't know if you mean... I'm going to, I'm going to explain that. The line, you are the particle, particle you are. I'm going to, I'm going to explain that. Okay. okay. All right, so this is was done in this is still historical. So in the XY model, remember in, two, in the two-dimensional case, the duality essentially what it tells you is that you have small fluctuations, but the real actors are the vortices. Okay. Whereas in the high temperature regime you have these loops. But in two dimensions, the vortices are contract and the loops are closed. I told you that if you go to any dimension, the high temperature expansion is still a theory of loops. So that's not going to change. But in three dimensions, the vortices are lines, they're actually loops themselves. But they have different energetics. The interactions of the loops and the interactions of the high temperature expansion loops are different. In the high temperature expansion, the only weight that you need to add is basically the cost of the loop per unit left plus some repulsion at short distances because there are restrictions about what happens at short distances. And that's actually in the physics that is encoded in the Landau theory of Aesons, which is pi to the fourth theory that essentially corresponds to a problem of bosons that have short distance interaction. Okay, that's what the phi to the fourth term does. The problem with the loops is that it's true they are loops, but they have an interaction that looks like the interaction in magnetostatics. Okay, so you get the logarithmic interaction for every bit of loop. This is usually called the Biot Savart law when you study magnetostatics. So it's like loops of current, they have this long range interaction. So in that sense, there is no obvious duality between these two, and they are very different. Okay. So there is no way this theory can be self dual in any way. So if you're going to have a thing, so in the high temperature phase, you still have particles, because you can think in the time, one of the directions has imaginary time, as we did before, you cut this through, and you're going to see two particles that evolve in time and then are annihilated. But now the vortices look like particles with long range interactions. So the dual of this theory has to embody this form, this problem. And that's actually, in a sense, what these people did uh, to actually character, use this setup to characterize the phase transition turns out to be difficult. The loops don't, in some sense, they always proliferate. But the notion of proliferation for loops is actually misleading. The loops not only get big, they also get fat as you approach the phase transition. So, in fact, the loops become fractal like they, because as you the, instead of being nice and smooth as in these pictures here, the vortex loops, they also rattle around quite a bit. And that means that, in a sense, you begin, you begin to get closer to the picture of what the fight of the fourth theory was describing. So, for instance, there is no jump in the superfluid density in three dimensions. The superfluid density goes to zero at the phase transition continuously, whereas in two dimensions has a jump. And this is part of that physics. So the problem is not the same. Even though the formal people talk about the proliferation of loops, it is actually a misleading concept. We have to be careful with that. And I'm sure I'm insulting a lot of people by saying this, but it's true. 
It's absolutely true. Okay. So the field theory picture of this is so the dual has to be another theory with a critical point that in one phase has to have long range interactions, in the other phase has to have short range interactions. Okay, somehow. So we call the theory A. This is phi to the fourth theory. This would be the XY model in this representation, coupled to some background gauge field that you can use to prove, for instance, the electrodynamics of the system or to you start to compute the helicity modulus or any of the properties of interest. And then depending on the side, this is written here in the, in the Euclidean, not in, this is not in the Euclidean signature, this is actually in the Minkowski signature here. So the potential is the negative of this. So when M square is positive, so think of Landau theory, it means that you are in the disorder phase, so there is no condensation. When m squared is negative, you tend to condense. And there is a critical point that is controlled by what we call the Wilson Fisher fixed point. And the Wilson Fisher fixed point is well characterized by the epsilon expansion. The epsilon expansion is now known to five loops. And in fact, the predictions from the epsilon expansion are so precise that in terms of superfluids, the only way to test them with the desired accuracy is to go to the space station. And this you need to be essentially in the microgravity situation. And this experiment has been done in the space station, because I know that's the only contribution of space station to science. As well as the science I care about. <laughs> it's a bit expensive for that. <laughs> it's true. Okay, so you, because we know this with very high precision, and modern methods like the bootstrap and all of that have confirmed this. So we know, we understand this fixed point incredibly well from this side. So there is a fixed point theory. On one side, you're going to have these loops that have this logarithmic interaction or LOL. And on the other side, you have these particles that are from short range interaction. Okay, let me write another theory, theory B. This is a theory that Burke Halperin was obsessed about. It's a problem of a superconductor coupled to a fluctuating gauge field. Okay? And if you do the epsilon expansion, what you find in the four dimensions, the near four dimensions, that you lose the continuous phase transition due to the fluctuations of the gauge field, and you get a runaway flow, so the, the RG flow runs away into a physical domain where the free energy appears not to be bounded from below. And then you discover by the time you get into the unphysical regime that you have already reached the other phase. And in fact, what you are describing is a very weak first order transition, which is usually called the fluctuation induced first order transition. But that's actually based on perturbation theory, it's based on a perturbative reorganization group. And there is a question whether this perturbative reorganization group is actually reliable. No experiment has ever seen that. There is a similar issue in liquid crystals, where there is also the same prediction, and all of the experiments have shown continuous transition. So either you could say it is so weak that the experiment does not see the first order transition, that's the usual way out of the problem, but the other is maybe there is, since you are actually very far from the perturbative regime, maybe there is some other fixed point that is actually being reached in that perturbation theory that we see. Okay, so what these people did essentially, in a sense, they re I don't know if they knew about the work by testing, by the way. It's possible that they will discover it on their own. So this theory actually behaves the same way. Notice that I put the signs here on purpose of opposite, because the height of the symmetric phase of this theory, in other words, the phase without long range order, corresponds to the broken symmetry phase of this theory. So this will be the analog of the Higgs phase that I saw Bud Mouth in my talk the other day. Okay, in this case, these gauge fields are not compact, so they're no monopoles. So all the issues that I discuss are moot for this case. Okay? And so the gauge fields essentially become, you get the Higgs mechanism in this phase. In other words, there's an expectation value for the order parameter. There is nominally a Goldstone mode. The Goldstone mode 
essentially is eaten by the gauge field that it's usually fed. The gauge field becomes massive, you get a Meissner effect. Okay, and that's in that regime, essentially, the loops that you get, instead of having the rhythmic interaction, have short range interactions because of the screening of the long range of the long range part of the force by the heat map. So the broken symmetry phase of this, let me call it theory B, seems looks like the high temperature phase of that theory. And that's an, in essence what Breskin has shown. So they are both short range. On the other hand, this looks like electrodynamics. There is a term here which is like F mu square. Little a, by the way, is the fluctuating gauge field. Capital A is the probe field that I used here. So here is essentially the Maxwell term. And if you are in the regime where m square is negative now here, so meaning you get the conventional sign, you're in the high temperature, in the unbroken phase, then these are particles that interact with the gauge fields and they have a Coulomb interaction. And the Coulomb interaction in two dimensions is direct. Okay, that's a static force, okay, because it's at the Fourier transform of one over k square. In two dimensions, that's a law. <laughs> okay, so that actually, in other words, the loops of these particles here in the unbroken phase look precisely like the vortices of theory A in the other phase. So that's the intuition. You can actually do the, this in a more elaborate way. You can, so in a sense, if you are deep in the phases, you can basically map the properties, the quantum numbers, and all of the properties of the state. But you, in a sense, the duality, again, takes you from the broken phase of one theory to the unbroken phase of the other, from weak to strong. Again, it's the same thing as before. If I add a vector potential here, a vacuum field, to measure, for instance, the current here, or something like that, to look at to do the electrodynamics, the dual, in, in the dual, you cannot, it's not just gauge in this, this is already gauge. You cannot gauge what is gauged. Okay, it's true. Uh, in fact, the way the vector potential couples through a theory, this theory is through the curl of this little a. And remember that the curl of this little a, because it's coupled minimally to this, uh, this field has, which has a phase in it, uh, is therefore the curl of this little a is connected to the vorticity, as we showed before. He said there is a vorticity in two plus one dimensions. Okay, so the, in a sense, the current of this theory, which is obtained by differentiating this Lagrangian relative to the vector potential, let me call it J mu, corresponds here, as you can see, this is just J dot a, and J is the curl of little a. So this is essentially the analog of the duality relation we found before. In two dimensions, we had a similar relationship, except there were only two indices, and A had to be scalar. A compactified scalar. Here is a vector field. Okay. Yes? Why is, why is the blade not compact? It's compact, but there are no monopoles. Oh, okay. I'm using the condensed matter version of non compact. It's compacted because charge is still compacted. Yeah. Sorry, I have to be more, maybe Nati is listening to me. I have to be more, to be more careful. It's compact in the sense that charge is compact. Okay, so it is compact in that sense, but there are no magnetic yeah. moments. Another question I had is yeah. if, if, the, if the Wilson loops of theory B or the vortex loops of theory A, then the, then the Wilson loops of theory B can end on these gauge, on the scale. No, the Wilson loops of theory B, well, theory doesn't have any Wilson loops, it's a global symmetry. Yeah, I know, I said the vortex loops of theory A. The vortex loops of theory A essentially become the particles of theory B. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, would you say the Wilson? The and Wilson therefore, they are, they are detected by the Wilson. The, remember that there is a, there is a flexion. The, okay. This is not a, it's not a, it's a, mat, it's a matter field now. Yeah, well, and that, yeah, my question was, what does the matter field of theory B correspond to the in theory A? I would imagine it's a defect of vortex. Oh, 
Oh, like yes. Okay, okay, that's a good question. So I haven't told you the full spectrum. Okay, so in that sense, you need to have actually a code monopole associated with that. The theory, essentially the mapping of the operator that essentially corresponds to the matter field here, this object phi is not gauge invariant. Okay, so you need to glue this with a, some, something like a monopole from it to actually make together, make, it's a, it's a point-like object, it's a local field. So you need to do something like that. That's how it works. So, but the point is that they get switched and they share, in some sense, they are they have the same critical point, the same fixed point, if this Wilson Fisher is actually this Wilson Fisher well fixed point we understand quite well. This one is very hard. This is what I told you is very hard to do in the epsilon expansion. Nobody really knows how to do this in any kind of fraternal sense. Okay, so the conjecture from which was verified numerically, I have to say, by massive Monte Carlo simulations, the conjecture is that what happens in, in this theory is that you get what people call an inverted XY transition, because it looks like the same transition but with the two phases flipped. Now, it turns out that these fellows uh, well, Peskin didn't actually work on that, but uh, my colleague, Mike Tone, when he actually came to this, he concluded incorrectly that it, by actually doing the proliferation loops, the transition would be correspondent. And he, he was happy with that because he knew that the epsilon expansion predicted that. It turns out that a quantity like the core energy of the loops plays a crucial role here. It's a, Lumina is a strongly irrelevant operator, but it turns out that if you make the loops very cheap, if the core energy is very low, then indeed they proliferate and there is a phase for the transition. But if you make them very heavy, then you get the conventional Landau theory type of thing, the epsilon, what the epsilon expansion predicts. And there is actually a critical point So what well, the duality essentially predicts is only one of those which yeah, you had a question. Oh, you just answered it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I knew what you were thinking. <laughs> All right. So, okay. So, you could say that this is much of this is conjecture. There's nothing rigorous, not even vigorous. I mean, actually, something else that uh, 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 Elliot Lee, we mentioned him several times. He said that mathematicians prove things rigorously, whereas physicists prove things vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a very, you have to wave your hands, you know. <laughs> but it's true, okay, and the only way to check this is numerically, so for, I apologize for the purists in the audience, I'd like to see mathematical proof, but this is the best we can do, okay, and they take any proof, whether we are numerical or not, any time of the day. <laughs> All right, so this has been generalized recently to something that is called a web of dualities have been rediscovered by a number of people and much of this is totally conjecture and i will give you some ideas about how you can actually in some sense derive some of them or justify them so the first is the the one i just showed you i use this uh, uh, notation that doesn't have any epsilon terms so this it's like the notation of forms is A D V, which is A mu epsilon mu nu partial. It's short, it's short time for that, so sorry for this. And you get this duality. The current here corresponds to the curl of what I call B now in this case for some reason. Now then you say, okay, and I actually have been interested in the problem for for a long time. Can you do something similar for fermions? Can you do bosonization <laughs> okay. in dimensions higher than one plus one? Okay. Can you do this in two plus one? So imagine you take a theory of Dirac fermions with a mass m coupled to some background gauge field. Okay, the mass actually I will need a mass for reasons that will become clear. 
And there is this peculiar term here. It's a churn simons term, uh, which plays a key role in the theory of fractional statistics and many other things. It's a topology in general. But it's actually wrongly quantized. The churn simons term, if you include global gauge transformations and a closed manifold, then the coefficient here has to be an integer divided by 4 pi. But here it has an 8 pi, so it's half quantized. So it's actually incorrect. This term, as you will see shortly, is related to what is called an anomaly. In two plus one dimensions, there is no chiral anomaly because there is no chiral symmetry, but there is what is called a time reversal anomaly. And this is related to the Hollerfeld system, this phenomenon. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a moment. On the other side, if you were to, but this theory is scale invariant in the limit where the mass goes to zero. Yes. Well, why is I'll come, come to that. There is an anomaly in this that cancels that, or there is an anomaly in this that doubles that, depending on the same of that. Yeah. Uh, what's the normalization for your <coughs> Fermi on determinant? I'll come to that. Okay, this is part of this problem. I didn't actually define to you how I regularize. It's a Fermi determinant, it has to be computed. It's a determinant of, of an operator, it's a non trivial thing to compute. Okay. So we'll come to uh, If you actually, well, I'll comment on this in a moment. Maybe we should do it now. I could actually do this on a lattice. Okay. Sorry for those for people, people don't like lattices, they like continuum field theory. On a lattice, there is a phenomenon. So you can put the right formulas in the lattice, what is well known, there's a topological group of this called fermion doubling. You cannot write a local theory of fermions. So the simple example is fermions coping on the lattice with the pi flux of the new paquette. That's a simple example of that. So the number of the arc cones is always even. Then you can break some symmetries and make one of these so called fermion doublers heavy and leave the other one light. So what provides this, the regularization associated with this is the so-called heavy doubler in that picture. And depending on the relative sign of these two fermions, either you get channel number one or channel number three. That's clear. For those of you interested in topological insulators, that's actually what happens. Is the, in the topological insulator, there is a space transition between material insulator and the and turn insulator. And this is also present here. Let me come to that later. Okay, on the other hand, at, in the limit where the mass goes to zero, this theory is scaling by it. So whatever the dual is, the bosonic theory has to be scaling by it. And it cannot be just a free boson. A free boson essentially is a theory of the boson boson. So it essentially goes as a trivial fixed point. Whereas this has a non-trivial fixed point, and we deform with relevant directions. In the case of the ghost or not, the only thing you can do is make it matter by breaking the symmetry explicitly. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a stable fixed point in the infrared. Okay, so what you need is a non trivial fixed point, an analog of Wilson Fisher. And so the proposal, and this proposal was made by Cyberg, sent it, well, there is this. Paper here that, in some sense, summarizes what many people have done, but particularly this paper by Cyber Center, Rank, and Witten. Okay, the, it's an interesting collaboration. It's a beautiful paper. They don't agree on everything. I mean, half of them are high energy, half of them are condensed matter. And you can see how they criticize each other in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to see the issue, really footnotes. If you want a better picture of this, go to this other section. <laughs> It's really interesting to read, but the, it's actually it's a beautiful paper okay, in many ways, <laughs> <laughs> including that. Okay, so on the other, on this side, what you have essentially is a theory of is a scalar fields like five by four theory, you can match like this, but with a churn simon star which is properly quantized with level one in this case. Uh, and I will show you in a moment, actually, you know, in the derivation that we did with Raman. So it's not with Ram, but with Hart. <laughs> with Ram, we did an Aurelian version uh, with Hart. 
the, this is a problem that goes back to some conjectures by uh, Polyakov, actually, in 1989, actually, later, where, 1989, where he actually tried to do some of this. There were some additional things that are not included in Polyakov's paper, including the role of this anomaly that will come in a moment. And notice again, the probe field here appears in this form, which is essentially the same way it appears here. Okay. Now, back in 1994, I was also one of the people interested in this. I tried to do this calculation. I didn't worry about this uh, time reversal anomaly. I just computed the determinant in some approximation. Essentially, it's very simple to compute the determinant. You essentially do an expansion in powers of the gauge field, so you do a bubble, so you make sure you have gauge invariance in the theory of mass determinants. And we derived this identity, not as an identity as I did yesterday. This is not an identity as an later identity, but it's in the sense that the correlators of these fermion currents at low energies look like the, cor the correlators of the curve of these vector potentials at low distances. So it's the same duality. And this is, I mean, in the way this is actually formulated here is this term that does that precisely. But you can do that, you can compute that in the low energy limit in the early. Okay? So that you can do by actually expanding the determinant powers of the vector potential, if you want. So that's the best I could do in 1994. Okay. So just to do a one loop calculation. Okay. Sometimes, look, I have a principle never go to two loops. <laughs> <laughs> so one loop is good enough, and it actually has the anomaly, has the, the, so what the most called at the time, the parity anomaly, you see it actually in one loop. So you can see that. Okay, so then there was another version of this, uh, and this came later, it came in a conjecture by Son uh, related to the physics of the fractional Hall effect in the limit where you lose a fractional Hall effect and you are in the compressible regime. So he was interested in the roughly Lander level that was mentioned yesterday, I think, <laughs> by a colleague. And there was a paper by Marx, Metlitsky, and Ashwin Vishwanath in 2016. They were interested in the physics of three-dimensional topological insulators and what happens to the surface states that essentially look like the Essentially, like uh, wire fermions on the surface, basically, or Dirac fermions in my colleagues. Okay, so the conjecture that was also, so these people were aware of this anomaly. The anomaly in three dimensions is cancelled by the bulk, so they had a way to do it. But essentially, it's the same object that we have here, but you map it to another theory of fermions. Notice two things the sign of the mass is opposite. So if this is positive, here is negative, and vice versa, that's going to be important. There is, again, an incorrectly quantized <laughs> gauge field <laughs> that you get here. There is a mutual, this is a BF type term that you get here, essentially ADV, much like, I think I mentioned that this you can derive, for instance, the historic code is an example of a theory like this, but with the coefficient of two here. <laughs> Uh, so there are more fields, but essentially it's the same. And it has this term here, BDA, and this term essentially maps the currents of this guy to the currents of this guy using essentially this, except that these are the currents of the fermions. It's the same story. All right, so this uh, relation between this dual relation, which is a duality of forms, so it's, in other words, a one form, now is dual to this three form, which is still one form, but the vector field is one form that enters here. Um, so you can actually relate this the duality of forms is actually present in all of these examples. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is to go through a construction. It's not rigorous, it's rather vigorous that we did with art. And, uh, and I will try to, uh, in the second part of the lecture, 
I will give some applications to the fractional hull effect. And to an odd mistake in the fractional hull effect, that essentially we could understand using this technology. Let me skip that. So, what is the strategy? What we wanted to do is to generalize the loop models to incorporate the fermionic character of the particle. I want to, so in other words, this is the mapping I want to go through. Okay, the fermion boson mapping, the, firm, the bosonization mapping. Okay. So generalization of the particle vortex duality. And so these are the loops cannot intersect. Otherwise, the notion of statistics is still defined. So I need, because I have to go from bosons to fermions, I have to be able to transmit the statistics. And that means that the loops cannot, cannot, cannot intersect. Otherwise, there is no clear topology. Right? And we're going to get uh, in the passing theory, we're going to get linking numbers, which are these uh, universal factors that enter in the weight of the passing theory that encode the essentially the statistics. And the problem is a subtlety that the loops will require to be framed because essentially they look like particle flux composite objects. And you need to define, you have to split them slightly if you want. You have to extend the loops to real ones. And this, uh, so you can always attach a frame to that. And this is important, this is the way the loops actually can sense the background metric, oh, no, it's not here. Darker is not here. This actually senses the metric. It's like what Darker is here. <laughs> okay, so he will complain if he was here. But they do. <laughs> so, for instance, you can get things like the cold viscosity and all of that from that effect. Okay, so in addition to that, because you do, I always forget to break that, but maybe I can use this. Okay, you break it. So if the, if the loops are not infinitesimally thin, you can <laughs> twist it, okay? Okay, whereas if the loop is actually a, a thin line, you can untwist it. But if I twist this and then reconnect, it's like a Mobius strip, okay? So it has a non-trivial uh, winding number that in this field is called the rising number. It's a concept that was invented to understand what happens to people who have Build up DNAs <laughs> because they get, you know, twisted and, and so on. So the notion of rise actually comes from, from biophysics of all places. So we will play a role here. Okay, you're going to see that this actually is going to produce uh, very phase factors that actually, because it's through this framing, they sense the background metric and therefore they, you get an analog spin, in fact, the fractional spin. And so not only you formulate, but you formulate as a spin, which is non trivial. So it has to be both. <laughs> okay. So a loop model, again, will look like a partition function, it's a sum of the loops. The loops here are going to be represented by a bunch of integer valued currents, if you wish. Which are conserved because they can go into themselves. So this is, and the restriction here is that the loops need to be closed. Okay, well, that's right here. And there is going to be a weight, and the weight is going to have a real part and an imaginary part. Okay. The real part has everything that includes involving energetics. All of the topological properties are here. Notice a factor of pi that's going to be important. So let me focus on this guy phi. Phi is essentially a sum of terms. There is a linking number because we have many loops that may be linked to each other. Okay, so it's a linking number. There is a self-linking number, which is what I described, and there is a very phase that arises from the framing of this loop, the way you could define it. And so here is the frame. So the word line here has been extended to a, essentially a ribbon, if you want. In a sense, you kind of have to think of one part as being a charge, the other part as being a flux. Okay, and that's actually where this comes from. And the frame, essentially, you can always define a tangent vector and two orthogonal vectors. One has to lay flat on the on 
the tray on this uh, ribbon, and the eye has to be perpendicular. And so this thing, as it evolves in time, may actually twist. So the frame, the winding number, if you wish, how many times this frame winds into itself, is essentially doing what they did to this poor device. Okay? Essentially the same. So there are these factors. So there is a linking number between two loops. We'll come to that in a moment. So, and this counts, essentially gives you the statistics with a factor of two, because you're taking a particle twice. Essentially, it's like two grains. So it's fine that it's a factor of two. And then there is this quantity W, which is called the right for each loop. And it has a self-linking term and a term called the twist, which I will explain now what it is. So if I if I only had the self-linking term, everything here would be topological and would not actually feel the background space. But because of, the, of this so-called framing anomaly that arises from doing this procedure, I have, this is my frame. These are the, these are the vectors, this is a triad. So there are three vectors, there's a tangent vector and two perpendicular vectors that go around. And you can actually define the twist as this mixed product, so this is the vector product, so these are the tangent directions, and this is the which is here, and these are the two perpendicular directions. So it tells you how this vector is twisting around. And as a function of the history here, S and U uh, are defined along S, say, for instance, even though I say from zero to one, is the length of the loop. It's like a parametrization of the loop. And this will be the tangent direction. So this object in general is not quantized. And this is something that Polyakov showed in his 1989 paper, it has the interpretation of the very face of the frame. Okay. Yes? Yeah, when I have a loop, things don't have one integral, but here are two integrals. So you extend the loop into the disk, into the, into the sheet, what sheet? No, I have, sorry, the loops are in two plus one, that's what I do. Sorry, I don't understand when you have to learn one sheet. Uh, what I can say is that I think that this framing is a framing of a waterline. Of the word line, yes. So, yes. so just this is as a one line. Yes, for each line I have, a, I have the frame. And uh, so oh, each two one as a, a two line. Yeah, for, no, no, it's not two. This is just simply because the loop has a thickness. So if one has to go along the perpendicular direction, the other has to go along the tangent direction. So I have two directions. I see. So this be you just a. Uh, Integral, a little segment. It's like an extended, it's a little segment. Yes, yes, not, not, that's not all there is. Not, not but the important, important thing is that this object is actually the very phase. So this is the phase that was computed by Barry when he was looking at the idiomatic processes. It's exactly the same object. Okay. But this object is not a topological invariant in general. And in general, it actually senses the background space. So it depends, it knows about the metric. It knows how fast you're going along the loop, for instance, and things of that sort. So it's not a topological environment, and this is important. Okay? So, and this is going to play a role. In fact, in 1995, I wrote a paper with Steve Hewitson where we left that part out. <laughs> and then we got a beautiful theory that turns out to be incorrect. <laughs> but it's a beautiful theory I can tell you about later. I love that theory, but unfortunately, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, I hope Steve King was an idea with you. Uh, all right, so the linking of two loops, essentially, or any linking, can be calculated by computing the expectation value of the Wilson loop, in this case, two Wilson loops. So, I put the union of the two loops here in this chern side, in the chern side of theory. Okay, and this gives you, because it's a, an abelian theory at so called level k. The, you get a phase factor, which is e to the i pi over k, k being the level, level, and n gamma is precisely the linking number, which is a topological number. And this formula is the basis of everything we know about fractional statistics for a million systems, including the things that Manfred discussed yesterday. Yeah, yes. one question is the first expression. Yes. Uh, if u is just a little bit segment uh, away yes. from the 
you know, the loop. Then I imagine the framing is kind of constant. I have no U dependence. And then you have a partial U E. Then that seems to be weird. So it's a little confused. No, I guess it, no, it, because it's very dependent on the position. And so I'm saying in general, it doesn't have to be. Yeah. So this uh, framing really depends on, you know, uh, have a, a strong dependence on this uh, little segment. It depends, on, it's a regularization effect, you would say. But it's, it's a regularization that knows about distances yeah. and how I actually measure them. And so this may be different in different places. If you insist in being topological, then that will not exist. But what I'm confused is that usually that I saw the E is defined along the water line. Yes. And, uh, uh, and these are the two, the two tangent direction. You already because now these are the two tangent vectors are these two derivatives you can say. The, the, so the tangent vector is e, and the two perpendicular vectors are d is the dependence of the tangent vector in u and in s. The gradients essentially give you this is this mixed product defines the, the triad. Instead of defining just three vectors, I define them to be a derivative. One along the, so in other words, one tells you how the one direction essentially twists and how the other direction rides. Okay. So, so in order to twist, I need these two. Okay. But the point is that this actually, this object here, in spite of its beautiful form, actually knows about distances. So it's not topological. Okay. So please keep that in mind. Because this is going to give you the precession of the spin. It's what gives you the precession of the spin in the magnetic field. What determines the width of the ripple? That's a microscopic effect. The so does it vary really... as a function of s? Yeah, but the, yeah, so it doesn't matter. I mean, the width is some number that you put in. In fact, the way you do this, I don't even need to do that. I can add a maximum term to my theory and the maximum term provides the space. So it's a, you can do it in many different ways. But the important thing is that the frame actually can vary. That's so this is important. Okay. All right, so the action, the John Simon's action is this at level K, which is an integer. This goes back to the famous paper by Witten in 1989. The, the relation between Chern Simons and Link invariant. And this is a baby example because he was interested mostly in the non Abelian case. Okay, but for us, the Abelian is good enough. Okay. So, this, so the, the point here, what we did with Earth is the following. And essentially, we follow what Polyakov did and we got rid of some parts that Polyakov had that were not essential. So for instance, Polyakov had two species of bosons and you can do it with one. So there's no need of that. So you can rewrite the determinant. Essentially, this is actually it turns out there's a loop representation of this determinant, provided it's massive, which is you need to specify a regularization for this. It can be written as a as a sum of the loops, that's what I write here in, in this form with a weight, which is the energy per unit length of loop. So it's the mass that enters the vessel. And then there is this factor here, with a factor of pi, that involves both the linking number and the spin factor that I just described. Okay, so this you derive directly. Okay, and actually this is in Polyakov's paper. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, this will make expression amazing. Is there a, a, a lattice of version of this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there is a paper by um, Sri Ragu and collaborators. They rederive this by using a three dimensional lattice, and they do what is called a hopping parameter expansion. Okay. There. And they play the game of making one of the parameters heavy and the other one light. I see. And they derive this using, I should have included a reference. Here. And this was done roughly at the same time. So the paper we had is in 19, sorry, 2018. Sorry. And that paper is also from 2018. So there is a derivation from the, with the lattice driven. Okay. That's good. Okay. Thank you. I should have said. 
All right, so I'm going to try a boson. This is the boson that was conjectured. So I'm going to write it in the same way as the sum over loops. But now I have a vector field, this little a that is fluctuating. I have to add it here in the collection of fields. The loops have to be uh, essentially have to be uh, conserved. So they, in other words, they, they close on themselves. There is a mass term that depends on, doesn't depend on the sign, it's just the magnitude of the mass per unit length of loop. And then there is a phase factor, and I'm not going to include the, the factors that have to do with the, the, sorry, which I should have included here, the uh, F mean. Well, here, because this term is present, I don't need to have the, the Maxwell term, but in principle, I could have Maxwell terms and all of that. So the weight now, is has several terms. It has a term essentially when you expand this out that relates to the current J, which is J here, to the difference of the two vector fields because there is a vector field here and there. So you can shift A by capital A and absorb it here to some extent at the price of getting a term which looks like it up to some shift. And then you have the John Simon. So you have the John Simon's term and the John Simon's term of the background field. If I integrate out little a, notice that it appears only in these two terms, then essentially I get precisely the linking number that I had before in this theory. It's precisely this term here. You get all of those factors. So minus pi times phi, you get the term which is j added into the background field. And here is the John Simon's term of the background field. So what you find, if you summarize this, is that what is actually missing here, and this is actually included in this derivation, is this term, which was the anomaly term, sometimes often called the eta invariant, which is this half quantized gauge field, essentially it's a correction that you need to have here. And depending on the sign of n, this term is either canceled or doubled. And that's what is usually called the quality, the quality anomaly. So if you take this theory now with this term, and you repeat that, so this term is, looks like a John Simon's term at level one half, and I repeat what I did, you can go through all of this. Then you derive essentially the theory that was required. But you need to include this, include this factor for that. So, okay, so this is the way this works. Essentially, in order to get finally to the theory with a the positive mass term, you need to do the particle vortex duality in the bosonic theory, and you derive everything you want. So, you essentially what it says is that. Deep in these phases, you can make this argument. What we cannot prove is that this is true at every point. Because then you have to actually solve this loop model, which we don't have to solve. But we know the properties of the loop model. And so you end up by computing this the response relative to, with respect to this back and field, to two different regimes. And this we know from the lattice models and the theory of churn insulators and many others. That there are two possible phases. One, when time reversal is not broken, which is a trivial insulator, it has sigma xy equal to zero. And the other one that has sigma xy equals to one. Okay, there is a question is sigma xy ever equal to one half in this theory? And the answer is yes, it's at the critical point. And you can see that, for instance, in this famous phase paper by Duncan of 1988, when he took uh, graphene and he took some spin orbit like terms along the, the, the diagonals, that if you tune that to the critical point, then you get a sigma x y equals a half of e square of h at the critical point only. And so that's how it works in that model, and it works exactly the same way. So this is the best I, we have been able to do at deriving these rules directly. Uh, from loop models, uh, there is a grander scheme. Okay, you can also do fermion to fermion particle vortex duality. I will 
they will spare you that at the moment. And, but essentially, this is the analog of the conjecture that was proposed here. The way you do it is you level first the bosonization and then you reformulate the gas. Okay, so you go fermion to fermion. Okay. It takes more steps. Alex, yes. Could you explain the bosonic uh, Lagrangian thing? Uh, yes. The, so, uh, it was that Yeah. So, is it in yeah. the, for the M squared? This positive? one? Yeah. Yes. So, for the M squared, positive limit is it the, the fractional, the, the, the bosonic fractional point of one squared? Uh, yes, it, but it's actually the no equals one thing because the level is one. Okay, so there are two cases. One when the boson condenses. When the boson condenses, the gauge fields basically become massive and this term becomes irrelevant and there's nothing to do with insulator. When the bosons are massive, when these guys are massive, essentially they can be integrated out. And from these two expressions, you derive that sigma x y is one times this square root. Okay, so it's the same. So there are two phases there. The only thing is because there is a dynamical gauge field, the physics is different than the particle world. There are no long range forces anymore. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, so let me actually just simply flash this. I uh, want. Uh, so you can do the fermion to fermion. Uh, I think that will take too much time. Uh, I want to use these ideas to discuss some applications to the fractional proof in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you more or less what we do and then we will prove it on this one. All right, let's have a short break. Okay. Well, maybe I should continue, given there are only 10 minutes left. Shall I continue? Okay, so the fraction of the whole effect, this is a lightning uh, review of the fraction of the whole effect, electrons in magnetic fields, okay, in the regime. So these are going to be the Laughlin states only, or including. So there is this beautiful wave function that Laughlin proposed as a joke, as a variation of wave function without addition parameter. So it's the ideal wave function. We know it's, a, it's an expectation value of. A, Correlators in the CFT in hiding. I can tell you some stories about that which are interesting. So it's a dissipationless fluid. It's not a superfluid because the current actually moves in the direction perpendicular to the fluid. Okay, so the dissipationless for different reasons. And this was extended by Janandra Jain using the notion of composite fermions as electrons coupled to an even number of some fluxes. Uh, to a fractional state in the uh, entire hierarchy of states that actually Kunyang showed you yesterday, uh, one third of which these are uh, sort of these things that uh, essentially in the limit, when p goes to infinity, they converge to a number which is one over an even denominator, and those are compressible states. Okay? So these theories in the spectrum of this is well known. You have particles fractional charge and fractional behaving statistics. And this is what uh, Manfred told you that uh, he actually how he measured this thing. You can measure both of them. Okay, so these are abelian anions. Okay, they are one-dimensional representations of the ray group for those of you interested in that. That's why they are abelian. So if you take two anions and you fuse them together they essentially become twice as big, more to pi. And so, these are, so if you can actually get there, there's a finite number of classes of types of engines to use. Okay. The effective field theory of this was proposed by Shogun a long time ago in terms of what he called the, the, dynam the hydrodynamic gauge field. Interesting, you can think of the curl of this gauge field as the actual current. Of the electron. Okay, so it has this duality again, it's implicit in this construction. And the coupling to the background electromagnetic field is much like what I showed you before, it's also through the curl. So essentially, the current, precisely the current of the 
the actual charge current, which is this, cut process J dot A. And then the vortices of this fluid essentially are like particle weld lines that couple as in J of these vortices. So they have some word lines, and these are like the currents that they can flow. Okay. So in the, I told you about 20 years of work into transparency. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I want to set the stage. Okay, so there is actually evidence of a mysterious duality in this, in this problem that was discovered actually in Princeton in 1995, uh, experimentally. So let me set the problem. So if I take the limit of these J fractions, I use N not S here, as P goes to infinity, you get this one over two N. Each one of these states has a gap or has a charge. The gap gets smaller and smaller as you go up in the Jane sequence. The charge is essentially E divided by this denominator, and as n goes to infinity, the charge goes to zero. In that limit, but you still, so you have an average gauge field, so it looks like a problem of fermions or composite fermions filling up a Fermi surface, but they are still coupled to a gauge field, which actually has very strong, it makes the problem non perturbative. If you ignore some of these issues, then you can conjecture, which can be agreed, that this theory that we would be some sort of Fermi liquid. Um, I would say half of the theory is correct, the other half is phenomenological. And the phenomenology of this theory is actually highly predictive. It works really well with all this stuff. But you have to ignore the effects of this gauge field, which actually has all kinds of infrared divergences that have not been cured to this day. <laughs> so it's a null problem. Um, but if you ignore that, so one is the problem of singular forward, forward scattering interactions mediated by this. The other is that in that limit, because it, these composite fermions have no charge, the theory appears to be time reversal invariant, even though there's a huge magnetic field. So where is the breaking of time reversal? Is in the transimal term of this gauge field that is still there. That's the only trace of the breaking of time reversal. So it's not quite in your, or, you know, garden variety from a liquid because you still have this problem. So for instance, you would have a non quantized and non universal called viscosity and many other properties that are you know, essentially consequence of the violation of time reversal. And the other problem, if you take an inf if you, in the, when you do this flux attachment, you reorganize the lambda levels in the massive way. And so, provided you stay in a gap state, the mixing of these lambda levels is actually irrelevant as you go into the, in the infrared, as you go to long distances. But in the Fermi liquid limit, you cannot do that because the gap is zero. So, the place where the mixing is worse in this sense. Uh, and the reason is because the, the way you do the flux attachment is broken in space. It's not that you project it into the lambda level and do the attachment later. You do it in the theory without projection. And so this is a bit of a problem. And so, and in particular, if you actually are in the lowest lambda level and you send the magnetic field to infinity and you have filled <coughs> the lambda level with electrons, it should be the same as half filling the lambda level. We should have a particle problem. Okay. And this is actually not satisfied by this theory. This is one of the things that are not, this theory doesn't account for. Now, whether this is an important issue or not, it's a separate problem, I don't know whether it's a matter of principle. In particular, because there are other fractions, like one quarter, where you have only a quarter of the electrons, and there is no, there is no particle hole symmetry ever in that case. And the phenomenology is the same. You still get this from a liquid plus a gauge field. So the question is, what is different between a half and a quarter and a eighth and so on and so forth? Okay. So whatever theory works for a half should work for all the other ones. These are minor modifications. So Sun actually had, okay, let me come to that in a moment. There is another piece of physics that was left not understood. 
And when you go through, this was first seen in the plateau transition, but it's also seen near one quarter. So if you come from one side, you, you measure the IV curves in an experiment, which is a, the transport experiment. On one side, there is a, essentially what is called a quantum hole insulator. The IV curves actually tend to uh, curve like this. <laughs> so in a sense, it looks almost like an insulator, but they are activated. But if you are actually in the fractional hole regime, they get flipped. And you can take the data and, and actually add the transition, you get ohmic behavior, linear. Okay. So you have a linear IV in that case. And you can actually take the data, and that's what this was done by uh, Shivaji Sandhi. Actually, he was finishing his postdoc in Urbana when he was doing that, and then he became a uh, assistant professor here uh, with a, a fraction Shoni and an experimentalist uh, uh, name escapes me, but I remember Danny you know. Shahar. Danny Shahar, yes. Danny Shahar. The problem was that they could never quite get to the middle of the land uh, there was a debate where cell phones were actually spoiling the data. <laughs> there were all kinds of issues because they were expecting to see quantum criticality. And they couldn't quite see quantum criticality. But if you ignore that, there was this mysterious symmetry. And the mysterious symmetry, it looks as in, in one phase, the current plays the role of the voltage, and the other phase, the voltage plays the role of the current. So they are flipped. In other words, it looks like charged particles in one case look like magnetic particles in the other phase. It's the electromagnetic duality that is flowing. Okay? So why who ordered this? Why is the theory, why is the experiment subsequent? There was no theoretical explanation for this as far as I know for many years. And we now constructed using this method an argument that essentially supports that. And it supports that for any of these compressible states, not just for one half. Okay, for one half there is a special symmetry. But the one thing you have to remember is that there are two types of chain states, the particle-like chain states and the reverse states, sometimes called whole-like, but those are that's true only for a half. In general, these are the, these are reverse sequence, they converge both to one over two n. So there is essentially a symmetry between these chain states. There is a mirror symmetry in the product. And what we think is that is this symmetry that is actually at work in general. Because there is no risk, there's no, you know, no particle hole symmetry away from what happened. Anyway. So. Okay, so what we did is we took Son's theory, we added the anomaly, and we modified it slightly to describe this problem. So essentially, it's again a theory like the one I showed you before. So it has Dirac fermions, which are massless here coupled to a gauge field, which are Simon's gauge field, when in the case of n equals one, which is nu equals a half, this term is absent, but is not absent for a quarter. And then the other terms are the same terms. And, and this actually, I could add another field to make this correctly quantized. So some people like Nati Saiba will criticize me for writing this, but I want to do it with fewer terms. So in principle, you can write it. I can add another field to make it properly quantized. Okay, and this is the response. This is nu equals one over two n. You can see that right here. So the kernel of capital A is the external field. Little a does the flux attachment. And to compute the electron filling, you vary this Lagrangian relative to the time component of the background gauge field in units of two pi over V. And this gives you this expression, one over two n, one plus B star, B star being the flux of little a divided by the magnetic field. If B star is zero, so if little a is actually absent, this is like the case of HLR, helping me and read, then you end up with a filling fraction, which is one of the two. Yes. Uh, do you also need a chemical potential term for the is of fermion? You need a chemical potential, and in fact, this theory has the same illness as, as all of these other yeah. theories. Once you put the chemical potential in, which is, I didn't write, but it should be here. Okay. Uh, 
the, the chemical and then you're going to have a chromic surface yeah. and you have the same infrared problems in the one of the fields yeah. and uh, so it doesn't escape that the fraction determining the primary surface size is not very clear from here let me uh you're, you you know, need actually okay you're going okay yes you mean because of this yeah there. you need to put the chemical potential to do it carefully. You remember the chemical potential is like a yeah, constant it's a, it's it's a constant part of the of a knot yeah, yeah. in this sense. Yeah. You can think of this as the adding new. Yeah. The question is that over there, yeah. oh I say it's included. So that is a big A0 inside this. Right, well, this is being a zero, is the, is the external field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's where the chemical potential is. But the, the real question is that the once you get a given the field fraction, whether it's a time constant term. It's such that the permanent surface has to have a wide area which fits this opinion fraction. There should be connection between permanent surface. I agree with you. And, and there is. Okay. okay, let me skip that for a moment. Okay. That is good. Okay. I agree with you. Okay, now let me look at these guys. I'm going to call them the composite fermions. And I want to know what is a composite fermion density of Curie fraction. So you, what you do is you vary relative to the little a, and you get this expression. So this is you see, the density of a, little a naught, especially varying that. You get this expression for the density of these guys. Okay. And now, so I can compute what is the filling fraction of the composite fermion by dividing the density with relative to the flux multiplied by two pi, and you get this expression. If I set the filling fraction to be p plus a half, which is what you need for a Dirac fermion, because these are Dirac fermions, then you derive the James system. And you find that the electrons actually are in the James system. And you can do this for the reverse sequence as well. So if you make a particle whole transformation, not of the electrons, but of the Dirac fermion, so you do this, then you end up with a reverse sequence. So both of them converge to the same limit. In that case. Okay. So there is, a, in this sense, particle hole transformation of a composite without fermion, in this case, is equivalent to the reflection symmetry of the James in this case. Okay, let me talk about self-duality. I need to do, do a little bit of a sudden dance. So let me write down a theory. Let me do the Fermi boson duality first. So this is a boson plus G. Here is a gauge field A. So we have too many fields now. Capital A is the background field. And then you have a term here. It's a John Simon style term with a run. Again, I do this in shorthand to avoid having too many fields. So G is not a coupling, it's a field. And I do the boson particle vortex duality. So I map this to another boson, like we, the one we did before. This term gets flipped. And it moves 1 over 2n. And then essentially, you have the filling fraction of these bosons is 1. If I do reflection symmetry, the filling fraction relative to equations what are nu and nu prime, and if I impose a condition that they are equal and opposite and say this is 1, then the boson vertex actually has the same reflection symmetry that I had before. So the reflection symmetry of nu equals 1 over 2n is the same as the self duality of the boson in this picture. Okay. So this is actually the best. Now it's true that in principle here, if I play around with the mass term, I could actually violate some of these conditions. But if I assume that the mass terms are the same, then this is the self-duality of the boson is what explains the particle. Yes, I'm going to wrap up. Okay, if I had another lecture, I would have told you <laughs> <laughs> about the non-Abelian application of this in the grammar, including the only theory that exists so far as I know, that has only a Fibonacci annual, the only annual. Okay, so here it has some quirks at the moment, but it's the only theory that I know that does that. It's bosonic, 
But essentially, when you go through the Nanavilian version of this, you can understand the Nanavilian in this language, the Nanavilian translation. So they can be formed, you can, it's a phase transition. So you use the fixed point as a lever to understand it. So duality can be used to essentially <coughs> not only investigate problems that have been laid dormant for a long time, but also to get new physics, and in particular, new physics involving this Nanavilian thing. Okay. Anyone have one question? Oh, sorry. Any questions? Any answers? <laughs> <laughs> um, what is this theory that has the only NEM being Fibonacci? <laughs> <laughs> I just showed you the Lagrangian at the end. Okay, now the actual. So the proposal is here. It's a three-year, it's a three-year, three integer quantum cold space for bosons. It's sorry for further material. It's like a, where is it? Oh, here, this is what I want. So you have a two-to-one bosonic fractional cold state, which is a Halpern state, and two states with no equals minus two and plus two, which are also bosonic. This theory we do sort of sequential pairing is like clustering in this theory using this the non abelian formulation which is described in these notes or better rather than heard. It has two phases. One phase is just the Halpern phase. And the other phase is a is a generalization of phase of U two level three it's called comma one, the initial Navillian cycle has to be closed together. And in that, that theory has only one anion, which is Fibonacci. And anion, Raman bravely went ahead and derived from the field theory the, the wave function, which is a nice wave function. It has only one defective field. So it's not quite in the Lambda level if you like but the other expert, I mean, there are many fractional cold states proposed that have Fibonacci anions. For instance, the real precise state at level three is equal to level three. That theory has many anions. Okay. Most of them are abelian. So if you work to do the interferometry, as we like, Malfra discussed, you will have to disentangle the contributions of these additional anions before you can do the manipulation. And Fibonacci, we want Fibonacci because the genius can give you, you can do the topo universal topological quantum computation. So that's the gold standard of topological quantum computing. Even if we are very far from the gold standard for anything else. <laughs> okay. But if you want to do universal quantum computation, you need Mr. Fibonacci. Okay, and this is the simplest Example of this, except they are bosonic. So I don't know what the Hamiltonian is. We have a wave function. If anybody wants to hook up a Hamiltonian, you're welcome. Okay, and we'd like to do the fermionic version, which we have in mind. At least not explicitly. So it, uh, it, so it says that it's possible to have a theory with only one Fibonacci. So this is proof by example of Fibonacci. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker again for all. Uh, we'll have a break. And, uh, I think we all need a break, right? <laughs> <laughs>